Okay, welcome to another lecture. We're going to first do a quick review of the topics that are going to be on exam four, and then we will go into radiation safety. So getting into it, we have chapters 28 through 31 that will be on the exam. So chapter 28 was our chapter on relativity. So relativity that is comparing reference frames. So you're comparing re reference frames, comparing what you measure in one reference frame compared to another. And one of the real key things to remember about relativity is there is not a correct or an incorrect reference frame. There are just different measurements in reference frames. So you might measure the length of an object to be one meter, and somebody in a different reference frame might measure it to be half a meter, and you can both be correct. Now, of course, people can always make mistakes, but you can both be correct if you are moving at different, well, at, one is moving at a speed relative to the other. So it's important to understand our postulates. The postulates are what we're taking as our givens, our assumptions. And we have very important, the speed of light in vacuum is the same in all, and I'm gonna put inertial just because we only stayed inertial, reference frames. And two, the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. So, of course, identifying what an inertial reference frame is really important. An inertial reference frame is defined as a reference frame in which Newton's law of inertia, Newton's first law, applies. And in what kind of reference frame is that? A reference frame that is not accelerating. So if you are in a car and the car is speeding up, while well, it's accelerating, so that's non-inertial. If you're in a car and it's changing directions, it's accelerating, so it's non-inertial. Very technically, on the surface of the Earth, we are going around in circles around the center of the Earth, and we're doing big orbits around the sun, and so there's accelerations associated with those, so very technically, we're non-inertial. But the acceleration is so small that for practical purposes, we consider being on the surface of the Earth in inertial reference frame. So why do time dilation and length contraction occur? Well, remember Einstein's clock, the, the train with the little light clock in it. And physics tells you that you get a different time per tick, depending on if the clock is stationary or moving. And so if you are inside of the car, you're going to measure the stationary time per tick. And if you're outside, you're going to measure the moving time per tick. But they have to both be correct if the laws of physics are the same and the speed of light is the same. And so then we have to have time is malleable. Time can be different. And then with that time dilation, as we call it, time dilation because time is always longer than or equal to a minimum possible time, which we call the proper time then you also have length that is variable, that is malleable. And so we have length contraction. There's always a maximum distance between two objects. And depending on the reference frame, it could be made shorter and shorter. So you should be able to identify what reference frame measures the proper time and what reference frame measures the proper length. Something you can do to... If you know one of your measurements is a proper time, then it's always going to be the shortest time is the proper time. If you know one of your lengths is the proper length, then it's always going to be the longest that's the proper length. But you could have three reference frames. You measure time and reference frame A and time and reference frame B, but reference frame C is the one that has the proper time. So you have to be careful and you have to actually be able to identify what reference frame gives you the proper time. 
Um, and, and likewise for the proper length. So proper time is measured in the reference frame where the two events, um, you have a stationary, um, they're, they're at the same location and it doesn't move. Proper length is, ref is measured in the reference frame where the endpoints are stationary. Um, so you need to be able to then apply those rules to be able to find the proper time or the dilated time and the contracted length where gamma is that Lorentz factor You also need to apply relativistic addition of velocity. Now, for physics 152, that's all of you, but David, um, we only dealt with velocity that's parallel to the uh, velocity difference between the reference frames. So we used u is equal to the speed of the object, v is equal to speed of reference frame. And then we had u prime is equal to something like this. And remember, I always did it using subscripts. I did, um, don't have to use u if I'm using this, but I'll use it anyways. u of a with respect to c is equal to u of a with respect to b plus v of b with respect to c over one plus u a b v b c over c squared. So a is the, the first thing is the object and the second thing is what you're measuring its speed with respect to. And so that is what you use for parallel addition of velocities. Now, you also need to be able to work with relativistic momentum and energy. So remember, relativistic momentum, still a vector, but it's gamma mv. So it's not just dependent on v alone, it's dependent on gamma v and the mass. And then for energy, if things got a little more interesting, we had the rest energy is equal to mc squared. We had... The kinetic energy is equal to gamma minus 1 mc squared. And then we had the total energy, which is the sum of those two, is gamma mc squared. So we had those. And there were a couple other energy relationships that, that you might have, such as um, E squared is equal to PC squared plus E zero squared. Um, that is an energy and momentum relationship that turns out to be very useful for us in many particle physics applications. So you should be able to work with those energies and remember the rule, the um, complementary, or not complementarity, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the rule now, um, that if you have a new physics, in this case relativity, it needs to give us the same results as we had with the classical physics in the realm of the classical physics. And so if your speeds are greater than 0.1c, then you must use relativity. If the speeds are less than that, then you should get fundamentally the same answer if the relative calculation or if you use the classical physics calculation. So while what I would say is technically the things I taught you all along about kinematics were just a little flawed, they were perfect for the slow speeds and relativity does in fact give you, oh, it's the correspondence principle, that's the name, um, gives you the same results. So why would you use relativistic calculations if, you, if you're going to get the same results with the much simpler classical calculations? Um, this rule, you have to use relativity equations if speed is greater than one-tenth the speed of light. You can then go ahead and calculate what gamma would be. Gamma would be 1 over square root of 1 minus 0.1 quantity squared. So 1 minus 
0.1 quantity squared is, well, 1 minus 0 0.01, 1, 1 over the square root of 0.99. If gamma is bigger than 1 over the square root of 0.99, then you would need to use the relativistic um, equations. So make sure you can do those relativity things. Next, chapter 29, we studied the particle nature of light. We had, up to the last test, looked at the wave nature of light. And we saw the wave nature, polarization could only occur, and you might have had this on the test, if you have a transverse wave. Interference, that's two waves adding up, can only occur if you have a wave. Diffraction, that's waves bending around a corner, only occurs if you have a wave. Now, I said waves because you can have um, you can have interference or diffraction with sound waves. You don't have polarization with sound waves because they're not transverse waves. But in Chapter 29, we introduce things that can only occur if light is a particle. So the photoelectric effect is a particle with energy, and we call this particle the photon, with energy HF, is absorbed by a single electron, and so that electron takes on the energy HF, and then to get out of the surface, it has to lose an energy equal to the work function. Its work function is the energy required to move an electron, and it could lose more. So we had the maximum kinetic energy of the photoelectron was equal to HF minus the work function. That could only occur if light is a packet with energy HF. If it was a wave, you would have the amount of energy absor absorbed by light. Could be almost anything. It just depends on the intensity. The higher the intensity, the higher the energy it's going to absorb, and the higher kinetic energy would come out. Compton scattering, we had a change in, in wavelength. I know we talked, um, <clears throat> well, change in wavelength while we remained at the same speed of light, which means the frequency was changing. But a wave can't change its frequency. That's just not what it does. It can change its wavelength if you go from one speed to another, but it can't change its frequency. And so Compton was able to solve and get mathematical equations that matched what he observed by using the particle nature of light, saying that light comes in with an energy HF and with a momentum that's h over lambda so for the particle we have momentum is equal to h over lambda and then using conservation of energy and conservation momentum both he was able to predict what he had observed that is find equations that matched what he observed so again that can only happen if light is a particle x-rays you you have a cutoff frequency that could only be there if light is a particle. And then the, the Bremsstrahlung is, is not so much a particle thing except for the cutoff. And then you have the characteristic um, peaks. So make sure you understand those characteristic peaks. Those characteristic peaks are photons with energies equal to the difference in energy levels in an atom. Um, pair production. That is, you have a photon, and also the photon has to interact with something, and it creates two particles, like an electron and an anti-electron. Oops, I put a plus, or minus instead of a plus. So that's pair production. That, again, can only occur if you have um, a particle, and you have the energy you started with is HF, is equal to the energy you ended with. If those two particles were stationary, it would be mass of the electron, C squared, plus mass of the positron, which I'll put an E plus there, C squared, or two mass electron, C squared. Now, the photon has a certain momentum, so you're gonna have a certain momentum in the electron positron pair and there is going to be some kinetic energy with the electron positron pair as well so this here is a limit the um 
HF is actually slightly greater than 2MEC squared because you have some kinetic energy as well as the rest energy. There's actually more things that I didn't list here for particle nature. When we look at the, um, the spectra of absorption or emission from light, or from light, from a gas, that emission spectrum or absorption spectrum, once again, is something that can only be explained with the particle nature of light. So you should understand that there is a particle nature of light, that light has a particle nature, and be able to do these different calculations associated with Compton scattering, X-rays, and the photoelectric effect. Um, and then we have that wave-particle duality. Wave-particle duality, light is both a wave and a particle. Now, as we go on into Chapter 30, De Broglie, De Broglie, that's... De Broglie. De Broglie is the way I learned to pronounce it at first. Said that if light can have a wave particle duality, then so should everything else. So he said all particles should have a relationship between momentum and wavelength that's the same as you have for light. So we can define a wavelength for an electron with a specific momentum. We usually don't use this wave particle duality for anything more massive than an electron because the wavelengths get so short that the wave nature is pretty much impossible to observe. But for electrons, it is actually quite readily observable. And so we use this in things like electron microscopes. We get shorter wavelength and thus we get better resolution using the electron microscope. Chapter 30, now this was technically quantum mechanics, but we didn't spend any time talking about any quantum mechanics calculations. Quantum mechanics applies the wave particle duality to other particles. That's using de Broglie's relationship, saying that we have a wavelength is equal to Planck's constant over the momentum. And then we make a wave equation and a, a resulting wave function that the wave function describes the particle. And it is universally applicable, but just like with um, other things, you have this, and I actually had it written down here if you didn't notice, the principle of complementarity that says that in regions of overlap, you need to get the same result from your new physics, which in this case would be quantum mechanics, and your classical physics. And so your classical physics will give you exactly the same result as quantum mechanics for objects of reasonable size. It's only when they're really small that you see a difference. And so oftentimes people think of quantum mechanics as the physics of the small, because that's the only place where you see a differentiable variation from classical physics. So what we did get into in chapter 30 was the different models of an atom. So we started with Democritus's model, which was very simple. You take something, you cut it in half, you get two smaller pieces. Cut it in half again, you get two smaller pieces. And if you keep going, eventually you get to the smallest po possible piece, which he called an atom. Now, J.J. Thompson determined that there were electrons in matter. That is, the cathode rays he determined were electrons, negative charged particles. And he found the, uh, the mass to charge ratio um, from his experimentation. And he said, okay, so if matter contains electrons, then it must be a whole bunch of positive charges spread out uniformly with these little points of negative charge, the electron. So he called it the plum pudding model, or like I said in class, I prefer to think of it as the oatmeal with raisins model because that makes more sense to me. I've never had plum pudding. But then Ernst Rutherford, with the experiment done in his lab, they determined that when you shot alpha particles, which by now you know very well what an alpha particle is, they shot these helium nuclei, these alpha particles, at a very thin foil of gold. Instead of just generally being slowed down by going through that nebulous positive charge, usually they came straight through with no change whatsoever, like they didn't come close to anything. But occasionally they would bounce at all kinds of crazy angles, including just bouncing straight back at you. And you can't have these fairly massive alpha particles bounce straight back unless they hit something much more massive. And so Rutherford determined that we must have a very massive positive charge center, which he called the nucleus. 
and which we later came to understand contained both protons and neutrons. And then we have electrons orbiting about that, which he said they're orbiting around in circles like plants orbiting around the sun, notwithstanding that it was already known at that time that plants didn't do circles around the sun. There were quickly flaws discovered in this, things like if you have a charged particle, an electron, going around in a circle, it has to be accelerating. But if it's accelerating, it must be giving off radiation, and so it must be losing energy, and electrons should spiral into the nucleus after, oh, I don't know, a billionth of a second. And, well, that's not what happens. <laughs> and so that was a big flaw. Other flaws were looking at the discrete spectra of light that we have in absorption or emission and recognizing that that requires some very specific energies rather than continuous energies for the electrons. And so Niels Bohr came and worked with Rutherford and he came up with this Bohr model, which is the first quantum model. And Bohr hypothesized that the angular momentum was quantized with values of zero times H bar or one times H bar, et cetera. Um, actually, zero wasn't a possibility with his model. With one times H bar, two times H bar, three times H bar. And based on that, he was able to calculate the energy states of the electrons, the radius in which the electrons orbit the nucleus. He said the electrons are still doing circular orbits. It, it really was successful. And like I said in my lecture, you know, I didn't differentiate between the Bohr model and the quantum model when my teacher was teaching me this in high school. I thought they were one and the same. But they're not. The Bohr model has some flaws. Flaws in the Bohr model it wasn't able to predict why some absorption and emission lines were stronger and others were weaker. And, and some just don't exist. Um, it also couldn't explain why if you looked very closely, if you got a more accurate spectrometer, you could see that what looked like one line was actually split into multiple lines. The Bohr model didn't, didn't have any way to handle that. And so then we have the quantum model, which starts with treating the electron as a wave we find a wave equation, um, the Schrodinger equation is what it's called. And from that wave equation, we can solve for a wave function. And that wave function spits out four quantum numbers. Well, actually, it spits out three quantum numbers. It spits out N, and it spits out L, and it spits out M sub L. And N, the principal quantum number, is primarily telling us about the energy. It's not the only thing that affects the energy, but that's what N primarily tells us about is the energy. L is telling us about the total angular momentum. So the equation that we had from Bohr is supplanted by L sub N. <laughs> Actually, I'm just gonna put L, I'm not gonna put subscript now is equal to square root of L times L plus one H bar. And then we say the component that is in an arbitrarily defined Z direction, as soon as you put a magnetic field, that defines the Z direction. What the direction of an external magnetic field defines the Z direction. And so we have two angular momentum equations that come out of the quantum model. And the energy equation that comes out of the quantum model is E sub n is equal to E0 times Z squared over n squared, which is the same as the energy equation for the Bohr model. So we often like to think that, oh, Bohr's, you know, Bohr's quantum number is the principal quantum number, except that he defined it based on angular momentum. And E sub 0 is minus 13.6. 13.6 EV. So we have these different models. So you should understand the basics of them, what their successes were, why they were developed, and what their failures were. And you should be able to use Bohr's calculations, starting with that blue quantization equation, to find what the energy levels are, what the radii are, and so on. That would be you know, something in the synthesis type question. I listed three quantum numbers above for the quantum mo model. 
But we have a fourth quantum number because in studying electrons, scientists realize the electrons respond to a magnetic field. If it responds to a magnetic field, it means it has a magnetic moment. And for a charged particle, particle, a magnetic moment occurs if it's going around in a circle. And so they said the electron must be spinning. So this charge is going around in a circle to create its magnetic moment. And that's where they got the term spin. But it turns out that electrons don't spin at all. We know that. that it's not possible that they could be spinning to create their magnetic moment. So when we talk about the spin, it's a misnomer. It's not really spinning. But the electron has a spin that is S equals one half. And so that means that the angular momentum due to spin is equal to the square root of s times s plus 1 times h bar is always 3 square root of 3 quarters h bar. But the orientation, the angular momentum in the z direction due to spin, we actually usually use just a capital S for that. <laughs> and we use a lowercase s for this. I should have been careful with my... The orientation of the angular momentum in the z direction, or the component in z direction, is m sub s h bar. And remember, we had rules. m sub l had to be between minus l and plus l. m sub s has to be between minus s and plus s. Well, since s is 1 half, m sub s has to be either minus 1 half or plus 1 half, what we usually refer to as spin up and spin down. Um, Pauli exclusion principle, principle applies to any particle with a one-half integer spin. So electrons have a spin equals one-half. So Pauli exclusion principle applies to them. Protons also have a spin of one-half. So the Pauli exclusion principle applies to them. Neutrons also have a spin of one-half. So the Pauli exclusion principle applies to them as well. So the Pauli exclusion principle applies to all fermions, all one-half integer spin particles. And it's because your wave function collapses to zero if you have a, um, two identical particles that are not distinguishable. So not distinguishable means you know they're part of the same atom. You can't tell them apart. If they're part of different atoms, they can have the same energy state. That Once again, going back to my high school and college days, I was like, wow, so if I have a billion electrons or a billion hydrogen atoms and each hydrogen atom has one electron and each of those electrons has to have a different energy state. I have really high energies for those electrons. No, because each hydrogen atom could be differentiated so they could all have the same energy state. So make sure you understand what's going on with the Pauli exclusion principle and then Hund's rule. Hund's rule says that when we put electrons in, let's say we're putting electrons into a, a P orbital. Remember we have L equals 0, 1, 2, up to n minus 1. And we name these subshells with orbitals, an s orbital, a p orbital, a d orbital, and so on. S, b, d, f, g. And so those letters are telling you what the L value is. And if you have L equals 0, you could have m sub l has to be just zero and m sub s can be one half or minus one half so you can put two electrons into an s p l equals one that means m sub l could be one zero or minus one so you have three possible m sub l states and each of those m sub l states could have m sub s equals one half or minus one half so two m sub s states so you have three times two is six possible electrons that you can put in a p shell and so when you're putting those electrons in they're going to go the first one we just arbitrarily choose up second one it's going to go the same direction third one the same direction because it's lower energy to have them in the same directions then the fourth one will come back and pair up and then the fifth one and then the sixth one and so that's that's why we fill electrons the way we do in chemistry because it's lower energy Hoon's rule is all about it's going to go to the lowest energy state and remember i pointed out when we're filling, filling up p orbitals, we get some weird situations where we have like 4s, 3p, 
and we'll have four s just has one there. The three p then has one, two, four, five, and we will have a situation where it goes like this. Instead of pairing the four s and having then four electrons in the three p, it will move an electron from 4s out to 3p so that we have all six of those electrons aligned in the same direction because it gives a lower energy. So Hooch rule gives us some pretty interesting outcomes. And finally, for our review, chapter 31, radioactivity and nuclear physics. So you should understand first how radioactivity was discovered, you know, with the um, Henri Becquerel with his uranium salts that exposed film, even though there was no light that could get through. And then the identification of alpha, beta, and later gamma radiation, those are the only three that you really have to know, um, alpha, beta, and gamma. And you should know an alpha particle. Um, where do I have? First, uh, we should know alpha is equal to that beta is equal to electron and gamma is a photon. You should know those. You should be able to balance equations. So for instance, um, I carbon 14 undergoes, uh, I think it's a beta decay, but I actually have to look that up. So carbon four, yes, carbon fourteen undergoes beta decay. So the beta, which has no protons or neutrons, so zero atomic number, but the beta particle is going to be the result of a a neutron being altered into a proton, and so it's actually going to give you one more proton. And so we put a minus one here so that we have then something that has seven. So seven minus one is equal to six. That makes it nitrogen. Zero plus 14 is equal to 14. The numbers have to add up on top and bottom. And plus it turns out there is that little electron neutrino that comes with it. So that's an example of a beta decay and you should be able to write similar equations for an alpha decay and for a gamma decay. Now, I don't think I ever wrote a, de a gamma equation, decay equation, because you know what a gamma equation looks like? I will just show you. Um, so, technetium 43. 99 M. What does the M mean? Well, we'll see in just a moment. Technetium. <laughs> There's an example of a gamma decay. You can see why we never wrote it. There's no change. What happened is the nucleus went to a more stable state, but it just gave off energy in the form of a photon. And so that 99 M, the M is to indicate that it is a, an excited state for technetium 99. Um, and it's indicating which excites state. Okay, so we have exponential decays that occur because the decay constant, so the decay constant was the probability per time of a nucleus decaying. So if I have many nuclei, then I'm going to have more nuclei per second decay because yeast one has that same decay probability. If I have less, I'm going to have less decay. So we have the actual rate of decay, the activity, is equal to the probability of decay per nucleus times the number of nuclei. 
And then based on this relationship, the rate of decay is minus dn over dt, the minus sign is because if you decay, then n goes down by one. Then through calculus, you get n equals n zero e to the minus lambda t or r equals r zero e to the minus lambda t. So these are the equations that we explored in our lab. And we have this half-life, the time for one half of your radioactive samples to decay, which we can get from this equation just by saying let n equal one half n zero and solve for time. And we find that the half-life is equal to the natural log of two divided by the decay constant. So you should be able to go through and do calculations with this radioactive decay equations and, and you know, find the half-life from the decay constant, find the half-life from the half-life, find the decay constant. You should be able to do all that. Um, two final things, calculating the disintegration energy and binding energy. Both of those have the equation E is equal to, and I'm just going to put delta M, the mass defect, C squared. We use that in 31. We all, it also is used in chapter 32, which is not in the test. But the disintegration energy is going to be the mass of the, the components. Well, excuse me, binding energy is mass of the components minus the mass of the, the um, atom all times C squared. The disintegration energy is the mass of the parent minus the mass of the child times C squared. Child, we usually say daughter or, or sexist, I suppose. Um, so, but they're both fundamentally using that e equals mc squared. And we have the very useful constant that one atomic mass unit is equal to 930 uh, I think that was the number. I didn't look it up beforehand. Um, it'll be on the equation sheet, so it's not like you have to have it memorized. And so if we use that and we have masses and atomic mass units, then bada bing, bada boom, you get an answer in MEV that is simple to do. So that's a review of the things that are going to be on the test for exam four. Now I'm also going to talk today about some radiation safety. And I'm going to start with how we use, actually, it's not a lot of safety, but it's, it's how we use radiation in our daily lives. So this is an example of a computed tomography, more commonly known as a CT scan, or when I was younger, a CAT scan. Computed tomography, tomography means that you are making slices. And so in this picture, instead of doing a human, I've had a CT scan. I had most recently a CT scan last semester. Um, but they're, they're using here this, this old mummy, a child mummy, and they are then going to use x-rays. This machine here is going to produce x-rays that will go through and they will take x-ray images from numerous positions going around the circle. And then the computer takes those x-ray images and combines them to calculate what it looks like going across a slice. Um, another application is when you're crossing the border, they have this x-ray machine to x-ray your whole vehicle. And of course, you being the driver in that vehicle, if you're still in the vehicle, you're going to get some x-ray dose. So probably they're going to have you get out of the vehicle and then have the x-ray machine drive by. And what does that produce? Well, here is an image of two stowaways caught illegally entering the United States from Canada. We need to secure that border, build the wall. Um, I'm joking here, by the way. The, the x-ray, of course, you see a whole lot of, of structure in here. And this structure, like here, is the, those things are the construction of the trailer. But you also have you know, some little artifacts there. And these guys must have wanted to be caught. Because otherwise, you would like have a little hole in here where you would lie down and you have dense material so they can't see your body through the dense material, but busted. We use radiation a lot in medical situations. We use radioactive dyes. They either inject you with something that's radioactive or they have you drink something that's radioactive 
or they might have you breathe something that's radioactive. So in a previous lecture, I talked about, for instance, the QV scan, which, which was terrible. I really didn't enjoy it because they want to make sure that you are breathing deep. So they really restrict your airflow and you're breathing this radioactive stuff in with a very restricted airflow and you feel like you're going to suffocate. Um, but why do they do that? Because these radioactive materials give off radiation that then they can view with a camera. So here is an anger camera named after Howard Anger. It's also called a gamma camera. And if you have something that's producing gamma rays, then you have these narrow channels in lead so that any gamma ray that's not coming straight in is blocked. And so you have the camera, this only shows, you know, five scintillation detectors. Um, the, the photon hits it, and then we have photomultiplier tube that is going to amplify greatly so you get a big signal. But you have a grid then, and you say, okay, I had, coming off of this head, I had you know, so much coming from these different locations, and you build up how much radiation you got from everywhere in the head. But then if you rotate that around using the computed tomography, you can make slices and see the interior of the head. And what you're seeing specifically is where the radioactive material that's giving off gamma rays is. So basically you're tracking blood flow. You put this radioactive dye in the blood, and then you see where the radioactive dye is. And so, you know, this could be used, for instance, to locate where you have a tumor or you have an aneurysm or something like that. Um, a SPECT camera, single photon emission spectrum uh, computed tomography, it looks just like a uh, CAT scan, except for they don't have an X-ray machine here. They're not shooting you up with X-rays. They're just looking at the gamma rays that are coming off of the um, the radiopharmaceutical, as it calls it here, the radioactive stuff that they put in your body. Um, a PET scan, this one here is set down at the bottom, but I should put. A PET scan is positron emission tomography. In this case, they give you something that's radioactive that is going to decay, giving you a positron. So it gives you a positron from the radioactive material. But that positron is almost immediately going to find an electron and the two will annihilate. So you have the energy originally is two times the mass of an electron because a positron and an electron have the same mass. And that's going to produce two photons. Two HF. And so you have these two identical photons. They're going in opposite directions, um, opposite directions to conserve momentum. And they then have the two photons that they can observe and correlate. So instead of having to use the anger camera, they correlate photons from opposite directions, and then they identify where they came from and um they can get very precise information actually i said instead of having to use the anger camera actually they probably still use an anger camera because you don't want to have a photon that came from here be confused with the photon that came from here so that's some applications i do have one more example of an application at the end of the lecture but it's not a medical application so those are medical applications now radiation damage you know, the one thing you, I'm sure, knew coming into this class about radiation is it's dangerous. And ionizing radiation is really the danger. Ionizing radiation is something that is going to take a, a molecule in our body and kick an electron off, ionize it. And so when ionizing radiation is absorbed by DNA, whew, then it can damage the DNA and that can lead to bad things. So if one thing it can bring up is senescence. The cell, now I skipped one here. The most likely thing, cell or the DNA. <laughs> repairs. And life goes on. Right, if you have 
your DNA and you have something that comes and it kicks an electron off of one, um, one piece of your DNA, the most likely thing is that it will just reform and every, it'll be normal, no damage. That's the most likely thing. But what if that doesn't happen? So these things here are what if that doesn't happen? Of the unlikely case, unlikely case, where it reforms and forms something different. Well, if it forms something different, you can have senescence, which is basically you had this DNA and now it's altered, it's mutated, and it then just like deactivates, does nothing. Well, that's not really a concern. I mean, unless you have a huge amount of DNA that's deactivated, it's not going to be a concern. You can have apoptosis, the, the quote, program cell death. <laughs> Our textbook says where the cell commits suicide. So it reforms incorrectly as like, whoa, this is not viable, and it kills it. That, that is not damaging to us. We have cells that do apoptosis constantly. We're constantly killing cells, and we create new cells. The problem can be if you have too much of this. If you have massive apoptosis, apoptosis, then we call that radiation sickness. And what radiation sickness is, is you have so many cells that are dying that your body can't keep up with the demand to create new cells. And so then your body just uh, decays before your eyes because it can't keep up with the damage that was done. So a very heavy one-time dose can lead to radiation sickness and ultimately it can lead to death. Radiation sickness does not mean you are going to die, but it does mean you are on the road to death, you have a good chance of dying if you get radiation sickness. So that is bad. That is bad if you get too big of a dose, too much apoptosis. And then you have unregulated cell division can occur. You can have it reform in a different way so it's mutated. So these are all mutations. And you could have something that's like, wow, there's nothing else like me. I need to reproduce. And you have unregulated cell division leading to tumors and cancers. That's very bad. So this last one is always bad. This one here is bad if lots of cells affected. Well, this is radiation damage. Is radiation damage ever useful? Well, I'm going to have a slide at the end of how we use radiation damage to kill cancer. Um, radiation damage has its greatest effect on rapidly reproducing cells. If you have an embryo, it's going to be more susceptible. Um, if you have a cancer, rapidly reproducing cells, it's more susceptible. So we can actually use radiation to try to get heavy doses and cause massive apoptosis in that cancerous tumor to kill the tumor. So we have the radiation can cause the tumor, but it can also kill it. So let's talk about dose. Now remember we have activity. I didn't write it on here. Activity is the number of decays per time. And it has a, a standard unit of one Becquerel is equal to one DK per second. Or a common unit of one Curie is equal to 3.70 times 10 to the 10th Becquerels. So we have a common unit and we have the SI unit. I know our textbook refers to them as the former unit and the SI unit. But believe me, you are going to see a whole lot more things that use the common unit that they call the former unit, then you will see the SI unit. So that's activity. That's not telling you about any, anything about damage. That's just telling you how many decays per second you have. And you can have lots of different kinds of things. So absorbed dose is a measurement of how much energy was absorbed. And there actually is a unit I didn't put here, the, the Rentgen. Um, but we have 
the absorbed dose, the SI unit is the gray, which is just a joule per kilogram of material. So, I mean, just think about this. I have a lot more mass than you guys do. Well, most of you at the very least. I, I would have to sit down and think about every student to see if there's anyone that approaches me. Um, and so if I have an absorbed dose of one gray, that's going to be more radiation than I absorb compared to you because you have less mass. But the damage um, potential would be roughly the same because we have the same energy per mass. So that's the absorbed dose. The common unit is the rad. And you've probably heard of rads a lot more and probably never heard of grays. So the rad is just one one hundredth of a gray. So it's 0 0.01 joules per kilogram of absorbed energy. But different kinds of radiation can cause different amounts of damage for the same amount of energy absorbed. Um, an example is if you have, well, I, let me just jump to the next picture. If I have a low ionization density, um, that a gamma ray is not very dense in how it's absorbed, then that gamma ray can go through and it doesn't cause many ionization events in a fixed length. Now this cell here is going to be really damaged. It had three ionization events. This one had two. It's going to be pretty damaged. The rest of them unaffected. But if I had an alpha particle, because the alpha particle is big, now gamma, I mean, there's no size associated with the gamma, and the gamma has no charge, um, it has to directly have the photon hit something for the energy to be absorbed. The alpha particle has a charge. It doesn't have to touch anything. It just has to pass close to things. And you can see here, it did a lot more damage on its way through. A lot more cells in its path were damaged. And so the alpha particle is going to be more dangerous to you because you have you know, more cells along the path. And so we talk about this with two words for the same thing, either the quality factor or the relative, relative biological effectiveness. And larger particles and charged particles, they interact more as they go through the biological ma matter. And so they deposit their energy in a shorter range and are more dangerous. And so we have the effective dose, also known as the dose equivalent, that tells us how much damage was done. So absorbed dose, dose is energy. Effective dose or dose equivalent is damage. And of course, which do we care about? We care about damage. So the damage is calculated simply by taking this relative biological effectiveness and multiplying it by the dose. So a sievert is the SI unit, and a sievert is a gray multiplied by whatever that RBE is. Um, the common unit, the one that you're going to see all the time, is the REM. The, the rad equivalent man is what that stands for. Um, that's a sexist term, right? should be human, should be REH, rad equivalent human. But that's telling you about how much damage is doing to a person. And just like with the rad, it's just one one hundredth of a sievert. So when we measure the allowed dose that you can absorb, like if you're working in a lab, they measure it in millirems. How many millirems can you absorb safely in a year? Here is information about the relative biological, um, it was relative, right? Yeah, biological effectiveness of different types of radiation on humans. On humans, if you change to something like a shark, these are all really low for sharks. That's why they say sharks are immune to radiation because they don't get much damage from it. Um, so X-rays, gamma rays, and high energy beta rays, those are all relatively low danger, low relative biological effectiveness. But you get to low energy beta rays, slower electrons, and they become more dangerous. And then if you get to thermal, remember we talked about nuclear bombs, nuclear power plants, thermal means a slow, relatively slow moving neutron. They're more dangerous. If the fast neutrons, they're even more dangerous. Now I find this interesting. Fast neutrons are more dangerous, but slow betas are more dangerous. And then we get protons. Protons are about the same damage as neutrons, which actually I find surprising because the protons are charged particles. They don't have to hit anything to interact, whereas the neutrons being neutral, they have to interact. They have to hit to interact. 
And notice it says it's a 10 for the body, but the eyes are extra susceptible here to neutrons and protons, 32. By the way, the neutron howitzer that we have back in the physics department at Union College, it's producing fast neutrons, but then it has a bunch of paraffin to slow them down so that they're slow by the time they come out. So you're dealing with this RBE if you're close to that. Alpha and heavy ions from accelerators. So that would be, you know, anything that's bigger than a helium that you're accelerating with accelerator. Those are the most dangerous. So what do we do to protect ourselves? Well, this is an example of what happens when you go to the, um, to the dentist and they do an x-ray. So first, they have their x-ray tube in this box. So yeah, it's a little portable x-ray tube in that box. But it's lead shielded. It's lead shielded that, so that you just have a collimated beam that comes out. Um, notice this light is irrelevant. It's, it says x-ray tube right under the light. That's irrelevant to the picture. So you have a very limited range where the x-rays are going. But then they give you this lead apron. And that lead apron is going to stop any stray x-rays from damaging the rest of your body. Now, always make sure that it's covering you down here. Because whether you're a man or a woman, that's where you're most susceptible, um, your genetic material. And the final thing for safety is notice where the x-ray tech is. She is outside of the room. She, the room is shielded as well, and she's outside so that she will not be getting any unnecessary dosage. As it says here, reducing her occupational exposure. But let's talk about positive therapeutic uses of radiation. We talked about radiation that was used for um, diagnostic purposes, now for therapeutic. So one thing that, well, when I was in college, I took a biophysics class and we studied this topic about how radiation is used in the hospital setting. And we went to Loma Linda University, since I was a student at Loma Linda University, we went to the university hospital and they showed us these rooms where they had electron accelerators, little, um, uh, were they cyclotrons? Um, cyclotrons. And then they shoot an electron beam at a person and the cyclotrons, they move around so that you change the pathway because you're doing damage as the electrons are going through the body. And if you move around and keep it so it's always hitting this one point, then the amount that's absorbed around it is much less than the amount that's absorbed in the tumor. So the goal is to get the most dose on the tumor and the least dose in the material around. Well, if you look over here on the right-hand side, we have a diagram showing how much energy is deposited as a function of distance for different types of beams. So electrons, very broad with most of its energy deposited pretty short inside the human body. Right, the, the majority of the energy is deposited within the first inch of the body. So the electrons aren't good for going very deep. Now, photons, this shows gamma rays. Well, gamma rays are photons, right? The, the photons, they're even worse. They're, they're going to spread throughout the body, doing damage throughout the whole body. So using gamma rays, you, you have more depth that you can use, but you're doing a lot of tissue damage going through the body. But then we get to using protons. And notice we have different energies here for the protons. But what's the deal about the protons? Depending on the energy, the depth at which it will deposit the bulk of its energy changes. And so you can adjust the energy to adjust the depth at which the bulk of its energy will be deposited. And then you're having far less. I'm going to focus on the big one, the 190, you have far less damage to the region outside the tumor. You try to make sure that this spike here, this spike right here, is falling inside the tumor. And so you have much less damage outside of the tumor and more damage to the tumor. And then you still do the change the pathway around so you really minimize. And so the proton treatment, Loma Linda, when I was in college, Loma Linda 
was the first place in the United States to have a proton treatment center. Um, it was funded by the federal government. The federal government actually funded two locations, but the other side decided not to do it. And that proton cancer treatment is very effective for some types of cancers. Um, I always think of it for prostate cancers, but there's other things they do besides prostate. Um, because you do minimal damage to anywhere except for the prostate. And they make special little masks so that they will have the profile match the shape of the prostate. So you, you know, it's a thicker piece of, of um, shielding material for one area and thinner for another so that you will have different depths where it's depositing the energy. And they're very specialized and they have, you know, when I was doing a tour, I've done a few tours of their facility. You know, they're talking about experiments they've done with cats and they can knock out very specific parts of the brain in a cat, which, which is uh, fundamentally a little disturbing to me about, you know, causing damage to a cat's brain. But they can, they can very specifically um, knock out certain portions of a cat's brain and then they see the cat, you know, behavior change because of what they've done. So studying on a cat, I, I'm not a big fan of that, um, but they can be very precise in targeting their tumor. And so it's a very effective treatment to kill the prostate kill the prostate because you're putting a lot of radiation in there, getting a lot of apoptosis and just killing the whole thing. Now, I think this is my last slide. An application of radiation making food safe. A lot of our food is irradiated with gamma rays and pretty big doses. You have up to 1000 grays for fresh fruits and vegetables. Why did they do that? because it will kill things like bacteria. So it makes most fruits and vegetables last longer, less spoilage, and honestly, less things that can make you sick. Um, but you have to, to up the dosage. If you want to kill um, some uh, microorganisms, you have to get to that 10 to the fourth gray if you want to kill salmonella. So obviously there's good reason. We probably don't want salmonella poisoning. And even more if you want to kill a fungus. But that's why they do it. Now, this gamma radiation, they use a low enough energy photon that it is not going to create radioactive materials in the sample, right? It's radiation. Light is radiation. We're not worried about light causing us damage. Um, they're doing things that for a human, this would be devastatingly deadly. But we're trying to kill the living things in these fruits or vegetables or whatever and it doesn't leave behind a radioactive residue. Now, what it does do is it creates a bunch of free radicals, and those free radicals are doing the bulk of the work of killing. And there is, there is debate. There are people who think that those are going to be damaging to humans as well. And if you irradiate some things, like if you irradiate milk, it tastes bad. You know, it's, it's, it's not a foolproof thing, but it's commonly used to allow foods to be stored much longer. All right. Have yourself a great day.